Hi everyone, I am back again with another episode of the Ethical Consumer Podcast. Today I am here with Shelby Smith of Jim and Eats Crickets. And I'm excited for this episode because this is something very different than we've done before. So welcome, Shelby. Hi, thank you so much for having me. You are so welcome. So you are the owner. Well, why don't you tell everybody? Because I think you're going to say it better than I can. What is Jim and Eat Crickets all about? Jim and Eat Crickets is the producer of sustainable alternative protein snacks from farm-raised crickets. So we have a few different product lines. I'm sure we'll get into that later. But overall, we, we make cricket snacks. I love it which is very different, and I'm excited to talk about that a little bit later to your journey on down the road. But first, what is your favorite food? And it can be crickets or it can be something other than crickets. <laughs> oh, I mean, it has to be crickets. I don't think I get a choice on this one. So <laughs> I love it. Do you have a favorite flavor or a favorite format? You guys have powder, you have bars, and you have dry roasted. Yeah, right now I am on a big powder kick. I've been having a cricket smoothie a day. I'm going to change that as cricket smoothie a day keeps the doctor away kind of thing. I like so it. I've been doing, um, yeah, frozen strawberries, almond butter, coconut milk, and a quarter cup of uh, cricket powder, and then a teaspoon of maca powder as well because I like maca. But Ooh, yes. So yeah, that has been, that's been my jam lately. Cool. So. Maca or ma maca or maca, I never know what which way to say it, but that has been one of those, you know, there's so much stuff out there, so many superfoods. In the last episode, I talked to Nikoya a little bit about like the biohacking and how many good things you could possibly ingest to make your body function better than it already is. But maca is one that I notice a huge difference when I'm taking it compared to when I'm not. Yeah, I, well, and I got into it. I had a friend recommend it to me at one point, but honestly, I, I didn't take it for any of the benefits. I actually really like the taste, like mm -hmm. the flavor profile that it adds to it. It's kind of like a cinnamony ginger sort of thing that I yeah. just, I really like it. So this, I like the smell. It smells caramely almost, but like it's only when you open the bag, you don't want to inhale because it is definitely a powder and it'll make you sneeze. And I've done it before. <laughs> same, same. <laughs> But, oh, cool. Oh, I like that. And I like that you shared your recipe. I'll probably ask you for a few more recipes um, later on in the episode, too. But what sure. is what is your story? How did you end up in cricket farming? Well, so I grew up wanting to be a cricket farmer, didn't you? Uh, I, I mean, everybody... like, I thought about locusts, but... Um... <laughs> but changed your mind. No, I get it. Um, <laughs> no, honestly, growing up, I wanted nothing to do with agriculture growing up here in Iowa and being a farmer's daughter wanted nothing to do with it was zero help on the farm growing up but I was really athletic so that ended up paying off well for me because I ended up going to college on full basketball scholarship to St. Joseph's University out in Philadelphia and then after that I graduated from there with a degree in finance and I am one tax class away from having a double major in financial planning but it was an 8 30 a.m second semester senior year after the season was over and I didn't need to stay eligible anymore so I just dropped it and <laughs> said I don't need a double major um but after graduation I went over to Ireland with a program called Sport Changes Life so they're based out of Belfast which is in Northern Ireland different country than Ireland itself part of the UK um but so they brought over former student athletes as a three-part program. So it was part education. So I got to get a master's degree at an Irish university, part service. So we coached in underprivileged areas. And then we got to continue our playing career as well. So I played in the National Premier League in Ireland, which is the National League around Ireland. Um, I was only supposed to be there for a year. Got my master's in finance as well. So I have an undergrad and a master's in finance. Um, only supposed to be there for a year. They have one-year master's programs in Ireland, which was kind of cool. But I fell in love with the country, fell in love with the people and the team, and really wanted to keep playing. So I went looking for a job and wound up as a risk intern on a brand-new trading desk for a Canadian bank in Dublin. Um, six months later, wound up as an equity derivatives trader for that Canadian bank. Um, not something, again, that I ever thought I was going to do. I just kept getting free school from basketball. So I kept <laughs> doing finance degrees because I was on that track, but I never really had any desire to be in finance. Um, but so I wound up on this trading desk, 
We were really tiny when I started. There were only seven of us. And um, at the time, we had about $30 million in trades on the books, which might sound like a lot to somebody who's not in finance, but it's tiny. Um, Fast forward three and a half years later when I handed in my notice because I just really wasn't satisfied. We had just hired our 30th employee and had about $10.5 billion dollars in trades on the book. So it was a lot of growth in a very short amount of time. Yeah, I say that was my first like foray into startup kind of culture um, because it sort of was. But I'm thankful for cutting my teeth in that industry and learning a ton. Uh, You know, it set me up for for many things in the future, but uh, it just wasn't for me. So quit and I moved back to the conventional family farm northeast of Ames where uh, my dad's farmed about 2,000 acres of corn and soybeans. Uh, since the 80s and um, came home and helped him with harvest. So uh, then, you know, we started, I I made it through, this was, gosh, when was this? October of 2017 and um, made it through harvest with him. And then we started having conversations about what I was going to do in the future. And he said, you know, you don't have to do what I've done for the last 30 years, fight the same markets you know, corn and soybeans and mono crop culture and all of the bad stuff that goes with that. Like there's other options out there. If you guys want to do something else, go for it. We'll help you get started. I mean, I don't think that they thought I would end up on crickets, but (laughs) here we are. So fast forward a couple months and I had found an article about a woman raising crickets for human consumption. And I said, Hey, I think I can do that and sent it to them. And uh, neither of them said no, they said, that's cool. You know, there's weirder things we've seen go. So do some research and and see what you come up with. And so I hit YouTube and the rest of the internet to see what I could find out. And uh, 10 days later, I bought 10,000 crickets before I had eaten my first cricket and said, uh, all right, let's see if we can make this work. So that was three years ago. Oh my gosh. What was your experience like eating your first cricket. How did you how did you decide to do that once you had your little cricket buddies? <laughs> well, so I mean, to be fair, I had ordered the cricket products off of Amazon, um, which I don't recommend because there's not some high quality ones on there. But uh, so I ordered my first cricket products off of Amazon before I ordered my first live crickets. I just hadn't gotten them yet. So the crickets. This was. January when I ordered the live crickets. Crickets need to be kept warm, so shipping them in the winter is a bit of a challenge, and honestly, shipping shipping them in the summer is a challenge as well because they can't get too hot. So you imagine um, the you, you have to have overnight shipping regardless. So I had two day shipping, I think, on the Amazon stuff, which is why I got it the day after. But uh, the live crickets. My first experience with eating the crickets, I got. I remember I got bars with the cricket powder in them. So ground up and mixed in. And then I also got a few flavors of these really poorly prepared, like roasted crickets that were whole. Um, But I definitely had hesitation looking at the eyeballs of the first crickets I was eating. The bars were totally, (laughs) yeah, exactly. It's it's the, it was mental. And I definitely hesitated, but you know, I looked at it and was like, all right, you're going to try and get other people to do this. So you need to do it first. Right. Uh, So bottoms up from there. And you know, now it's no big deal. I love it. So what was the first product that you decided to create? Oh, do you remember? So I've always, I've always had three product lines. Like I don't, the, the three that I have now are the three that I've always had. Um, except for, I suppose the energy bars at the beginning were like these energy bites or protein balls or whatever I called them at the time. Um, but I found them to be very inconvenient for people to purchase and take home. Like they're, it just, they weren't a very good grab and go sort of snack, which is what I wanted them to be. So I've always had roasted crickets. I've always had energy bars with the crickets ground up and mixed in. And then for the first two years, especially, I didn't have any cricket powder in stock. Like people would really, were really curious to, to try the cricket powder itself, but I just didn't have enough crickets to be able to do it. Um, So now I'm really excited that I can offer it in multiple different sizes. But yeah, so it's always been those three from the beginning. Okay, got you. Which one do you feel like you reach for most? You said right now you're on the powder kick. Yep. Um, 
So it's usually either the powder or the roasted. Although that being said, like I have recently been grabbing my bars a lot because I'm always somewhere where there's a bar around and I'm like, shoot, I need to eat. Like I'll forget, you know, I'll get so caught up in stuff that I like forget to eat. And then, um, but the bars are super easy for me to grab. And every time I eat them too, I'm like, dang, these are really good. <laughs> it's one of those things that I just, I forget. Cause I, I don't, uh, I get so caught up in, you know, trying to fulfill orders and trying to, you know, sell them at events and stuff that I don't necessarily get high on my own supply very often. But, um, it's it's uh, one of those things that I've gotten better about eating crickets on a daily basis now. Yeah. Now you you said you started with basketball, is that correct? And that took you to Ireland, right? In Ireland, pardon me. Yes, I will differ. No, I was I was no, I was in I was actually in the Republic of Ireland, so okay. I was in Dublin. Uh, the program was just based out of Northern Ireland. So okay, gotcha. Yeah. Yep. What are you doing now as far as athletics? We talked about that a little bit before. And how do you fuel yourself for those activities with the crickets? Yeah, good question. Well, so I've had quite the journey on in that respect as well. Um, so I played that first year that I was in Ireland and the second year that I was in Ireland. By the third year, my demands at work, like in my trading career, were so much that I couldn't. I couldn't play um, that year. And then I had a team that like tried to bring me back again. Anyways, I eventually ended up uh, hanging up the basketball shoes because it was just time. That being said, I will play in the Ames men's rec league on occasion and tear it up in the, nice. in the, <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's for the, it's definitely like the washed up Olympics, but it's fun. Um, so we do that. And then uh so I, I hung up the basketball shoes and then went and um, got into, I did a bodybuilding competition in 2015. Really didn't like it, but it was a good learning experience. And then after that, I got into uh, obstacle course racing. So like Tough Mudder, Spartan Race, all that kind of stuff. Um, the first year I did that, I ended up qualifying for Spartan Race World Championships out in Tahoe. So I went and did that in... 2016, and then I also did the World's Toughest Mudder, which is a 25 and a half hour tough mudder. It goes overnight, like it's horrible. I don't know why anyone does it, and I did that, and then I did it again. So I did it again in 2017 as well. Uh, so that was my big thing, but now I've gotten more into um, I've dabbled in CrossFit and stuff like that too. But uh, I got into powerlifting, um, did a powerlifting meet in. February of 19, it was my first and probably my last, so I should just walk away from it. I set two national records in my weight class in my first hour lifting me. And then I was girl. like, okay, I, I think I'm going to hang it up now. I think I'm going to be done. Just going <laughs> to walk away at that point. Um, and then, so I just mess around. Now it's more about, um, you know, just being healthy and, and having that stress release for me with as a business owner and going 24 seven, like if I can take the hour to go, you know, lift or, you know, I take the dog for a walk every morning outside. That is the key, you know, being outside, no matter, no matter what the conditions are. Um, so it's all of that. I've now sort of come to a let's step away from competition side of things and let's lift for longevity. But, um, I'll let you know how it goes. I haven't been doing it for long, but it's one of those things that uh, we'll see. I need to have physical activity. Um, and then, you know, the crickets obviously were born out of that, of that love for physical activity and the need for protein and the need to fuel your body correctly and properly and have, you know, all the necessary nutrients and crickets do offer that. So, uh, I like to, right now, I like said I'm on the cricket smoothie kick. So that's been my post workout every day has been one of those cricket smoothies. And then, um, but if I don't have a smoothie making ability because of wherever I'm at, I can grab a bar or a bag of roasted crickets, no problem. So that's usually, that's where I'm at now. It's nice that you're able to have three different products and one is, one is very much a kitchen staple. One is kind of like a snack by the handful. 
And then the bar is, like you said, grab and grow. Grab, grab and grow, grab and go. Like, you yeah. have something for every every part of your day and every situation possible. Like, even on... And by the way, you said, how would anyone ever do that? And you did it twice, the 25-hour... <laughs> Shelby, <laughs> I know, but yeah. I can see the bar even being good sustenance for that too. Just like any other bar or gel or goo or two or, you know, whatever it's, there's dates in it. If I, is there dates in it? Yep. There's dates in it. So that is, that's the carb source and the binder. And then you have the sunflower seeds to really give the meat and the texture of the bar, and then you have the cricket powder in there. And why I like those, um, at one point I was doing, I mean, technically I suppose those uh, Tough Mudders are like ultra marathons and that kind of stuff. Um, I never had any desire to do a marathon, but when I started the cricket, so funny aside story, after I'd done my second World's Toughest Mudder in November of 2017, um, it was maybe like a week later because that's always the second week of November, it seems like. Um, a week later, I had a friend of mine who was coming back for Thanksgiving and he was like, oh, I'm going on a ruck with a couple friends because like we're going to do this this ruck thing in uh, March of next year. Like, do you want to come along? And I was like, yeah, like I'll be a, a week post World's Toughest Mudder. So, I mean, I should be fairly recovered at that point, hopefully. But like, yeah, I'll come along. And so I came along and had like my little 10 pounds in my in my bag. And they were telling me about what they were going to do. And it's called the Baton Death March. It's down in New Mexico, which worked out perfect because my brother, my brother is an F-16 pilot. And he was actually stationed in New Mexico at the time, he and his family. And so... If I wanted to do this event, I had a place to stay that was only half an hour away. So it's perfect. Um, but so what it is, though, is a, it's a marathon with a 35 pound pack, like through the desert. And so I've never done an actual marathon, but I've done a marathon with a 35 pound pack on my back. But uh, the whole point of that, though, is I was doing a lot of running. I was doing a lot of um, more endurance based stuff why I really liked my bars versus a, a different bar option was um, I don't know about you, but I can't have any sort of like dairy product before I work out. I'm not, I'm not um, lactose intolerant or anything like that. I, you know, I'm, I'm of very Northern European descent. So like we are about the only ones in the world that are not lactose intolerant. Um, and so I don't have any issues with it normally, but if I try and, have it and then work out. I don't feel very good. I feel bloated. I feel sluggish. Um, I don't have that with crickets. So my bar is perfect for that, which is it's great. So I did, let's see. So this, I think it would have been a year before you were doing all of this. I ran the Des Moines marathon actually. And it was, it was a similar situation. It was, it was kind of a struggle to figure out how I wanted to fuel myself because dairy and I don't get along that well. Yeah. And pretty much everything, I mean, you need, you need carbs, but then like most things for endurance, you also want to have a digestible form of protein in it. And it's always whey. Right. And I can't have like whey is the part that is the most upsetting for me. It's not necessarily the, I don't, I don't know if it's, I, I don't know the fat and the protein and how, how everything breaks down in dairy. Sometimes you're allergic to the milk protein. Sometimes you're allergic to the lactose in it, but I just can't do it. I've tried whey protein powders before. I, I don't eat, um, I don't consume any animal products right now where I'm at just like lifestyle wise. But when I was, pro oh, whey protein was the worst offender. It made it made me so sick. I'm not going to, I'm going to stop talking about that right now, but it was just like really not okay. <laughs> yeah, no. And i and that is, um, again, that's a similar experience that I had. And, and generally like if I have, you know, if I have whole milk, um, whole milk Greek yogurt or something like that, I have no problems with any of that, mm -hmm. but it is, it's a, uh, if I tried to do that before I work out, I don't know if it's just the inflammation from working out that irritates me. I, it just does not work for me, but I've never had that issue with crickets. So nice. that's been a really big plus. And some, the nice thing I would, I would assume about crickets too, when I'm looking for something to supplement anything, 
I don't like when there's a laundry list of ingredients, and I've said this before on the podcast with other guests and their creations, I don't like when there's a huge list. Like I would really prefer to eat one thing or two things. Like I am more likely to grab a handful of dates or and by handful, I mean like three. I mean, I'm not gonna get like so sugared up. I have small paws. So <laughs> I'll grab like three dates. I will grab some hemp seeds because I love the macros of hemp seeds, pumpkin seeds, something like that, almonds, whatever. I would rather have a bowl. This is this has been featured on my Instagram stories and people are starting to judge me for it, I fear. But I will just grab a bowl and put a whole bunch of good stuff in it and like eat it with a spoon or put a little bit of peanut butter or almond milk in it so it like kind of sticks together. Not unlike a bar. Like I would just rather have a whole food ingredients, a list that's like six ingredients or less instead of this huge hydrolyzed whey powder with soy protein isolate added for extra benefits and all of the all of the added things nothing in there is natural it's all added because something was lacking something and they decided to separate the single whole ingredient and like just make this frankenstein powder clearly i'm stirred up <laughs> i used to work at a health food store and stuff like that just like grinds my gears <laughs> yeah no and i'm totally with you on that and it's um i mean that has kind of been the foundation of of all of my products is with the flavor like, i don't like doing you know natural quote unquote natural flavors and that are not natural but you can call them natural because the powers that be said that it's fine. <laughs> like all, I don't that stuff. I'm with you on like having a very straightforward, simple ingredient list. And I always say that, you know, I get a lot of people that are like, well, why would I want, you know, your cricket powder versus, you know, a whey protein that you can get like the whey protein is way cheaper. I'm like, yeah, that's cool. But like, do you know what's in your whey protein? Like they don't necessarily, there's, it, it, there's a lot of different things in that industry that I think are wrong. Um, from, you know, not cleaning vats in between things. So you end up with contaminants from something that you shouldn't have. Like there's a reason that, you know, WADA tested athletes are supposed to keep samples of all of their supplements that they're taking because sometimes you get tainted supplements because things are not done the way they should be done. And you end up with a substance that is banned within your sport. And, you know, you hear horror stories about that. I can tell you what's in my cricket powder. It's cricket. It's a cricket. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's ground up and it doesn't look like a cricket, but it's crickets. And so I think there is a, there's a value and there's a simplicity in that. And then sort of on that note too, there are people within the edible insect industry that um, in order to cater to a more macro sensitive crowd, I suppose is what I would call them. They're actually taking and like defatting the crickets, which also is not my jam. Like I, it's again, I, it's not something I want to manipulate. It's not something nature put it together for a reason. And I think we're going to leave it that way. I think that's fine. So um, just a personal preference, but that's kind of my North star with everything of like, if I'm, would I be comfortable and happy you know, eating it. And, you know, if I have kids one day, would I be comfortable and happy giving it to my kids and, you know, being, being, having no issues, not wondering what's in it kind of deal. So sure, definitely. So crickets are already fairly low in fat, but you're telling me that they're, they're actually going through this process to remove the fat entirely. I'm assuming this is going to be a high carb, low fat goal. I, that is about the only thing that I can can um, get from it. it ironically, and I, I won't mention the, the name of the company, but it was a company that was making um, cookies, like cricket cookies. And so I was like, you, you know, you're feeding people cookies. Are you really that worried about the extra fat in? It's just whatever. <laughs> tomato, tomato. I, again, I will, I'm happy that there are other people that are on this journey of trying to get people to eat insects, but it's just one of my gripes of it. Um, so yeah, so the uh, crickets, they're 64% protein. So they are mainly protein. Uh, the only, they're 10% 
carbs, but that carb is just the fiber from the exoskeleton that you can't digest anyways. Um, they're one of the few like complete protein sources that has fiber as well. You know, you start looking at whey, you start looking at things like that. Those don't have fiber unless it's added, so like you said, in some sort of Franken food style, but this is a natural source of, um, there's one study at least that I know of that has shown that it's prebiotic fiber that may be beneficial to your gut bacteria. So uh, there's lots of studies that still need to be done. And if somebody with very deep pockets wants to go find a bunch of university level research for me, I will <laughs> I'll give them a laundry list of things that I want to, uh, to be studied. But yeah, so they're 64% protein. So double the protein of beef, they have more iron than spinach, more calcium than milk. They're a good source of vitamin B12. They have omega-6s and omega-3s, magnesium, prebiotic fiber, all sorts of stuff. And then, like I said, they are complete protein. So they have all nine essential amino acids in a bioavailable form. Um, so they're a pretty cool little pretty cool little bug. I like that. Not that you've had to rattle off those statistics before or anything like that. You nailed that. <laughs> the first time I've ever said it. So. <laughs> and amino acids are something that as far as nutrition goes, those, those are the ones that are a little bit harder to find. Now I realize that cricket is going to be categorized as a meat. I also see perhaps some of my vegetarian friends being okay with eating a cricket as opposed to eating a cow or like a pescatarian is okay with eating a fish because they feel like they could, well, a dear friend of mine, for example, she's like, if I could catch it myself, I'm okay with eating it. If someone yep. else had to raise it and catch it and butcher it for me, I don't want to eat that. And that is her philosophy. And I'm, I'm pretty on board. As I've said before, I appreciate all of my vegan friends, all of my vegetarian friends, I do not eat meat or animal products about 98% of the time, 99% of the time, depending on the week it is, if we're getting the substitute cheese for Friday night pizza or if Matt's using real cheese. <laughs> um, but it's that that's, that's kind of the difficult part is a vegetarian diet and a vegan diet can be, I'm going to say can be, low in amino acid profiles. And that's usually what's added to supplements. You see the amino at like, or the branch chain amino acid powders, the BCAAs. Um, and that, I feel like that's always highlighted having seen so many labels working at the health food store. That's the selling point. Look at all these amino acids that we've put in here from who knows what, but they got, they got really big numbers next to them. Look at us go to have one source that has all of those naturally would be just I would figure the most ideal as long as you're cool with consuming insects. Yes. Well, and so um, the amino acids and then the other big one that tends to come up is the B12 as well. So B12 is another one that's, that tends to be kind of hard to source when you're on a plant base. You can do it through algae and things like that, but the amount that you have to consume is somewhat daunting, <laughs> um, you know, to be able to get as it. Again, it has to do with bioavailability and all the things like that. So, yeah, there is, if you can wrap your mind around the insects, um, you know, one thing that tends to help with the vegetarians and, and the vegans and the plant-based folks or whatever they would like to put themselves in as a category. There's so um, many categories. So many. <laughs> and we love right. them all. We love them yeah. all. <laughs> yep, I, I try not to... I tend to not argue with people about nutrition because it's like religion and you just, everybody's got their own little way and you gotta do what you gotta do. So, um, but if, if the plant-based folks and the vegetarians and, and those, if they can, can wrap their mind around eating insects, uh, and, and understand that yes, they are an animal, but they're taking fewer resources to raise the same amount, like to, to produce the same amount of protein as you would, with a cow or a bigger chicken, um, we don't have really super solid numbers on just how much more sustainable they are. But I can tell you, it takes 45 days from hatch to fully grown cricket for it to be harvested and then turned into a product versus if you look at like a steer, that's two years from calf to water, essentially. So um, obviously, it's going to take a lot less, a lot less resources for 45 five days versus two years. So, and then, you know, many times, most people, when you ask them, um, 
A, don't think about insects as a food source. So it's an interesting, interesting to watch those gears turn already. But B, uh, don't necessarily have the emotional connection to an insect that you would to a cow or, you know, a pig or a chicken, it, the traditionally eaten protein sources. So I don't know if those are, again, it's not one of those where I would impose my nutritional beliefs on anyone, but it's uh, usually I come at it from a place of education of, have you thought about this? Have you considered these factors? Some people are willing to consider it as a source of protein and some people aren't and that's okay. So I, that was going to be my next question actually. And you nailed it. I was going to ask how long does it take from when do they, I, I believe they come from eggs. Is that correct? There's, there's tiny eggs that you, you would not be able to see, but I'm picturing my mother, my mother, every single year, that woman gets her milkweed and she's helping those monarchs out. She's doing it. And she gets so excited to show me these tiny little eggs on the leaves. And I'm like, I can barely see that, but good on you, mom. Keep going. She is the most precious human <laughs> in the world. I'm convinced now that I'm biased, but I was going to ask how long it would take from egg to maturation. I mean, is it a delicate situation kind of with end of life? Because if it's only 45 days, is there, now we're getting into the nitty gritty. Sorry, guys, if this is upsetting you at all. If, you, if it is, you've probably turned the episode off already. So thanks for sticking <laughs> with us. Um, is, there, is there a delicate time period of when you need to... Um, use the matured crickets because if it's 45 days to life to maturity, what is their life cycle in the wild or in captivity, I guess, is what I'm asking. Yeah. So good question. Um, so in the wild, let's assume Iowa, uh, which we don't, the particular breed of cricket that I raise for human consumption is actually the common house cricket. So if you go to the pet store and see these little brown crickets, chances are it's probably a common house cricket. They're actually native to Southeast Asia. They're not native to here. So they couldn't e exist and survive in the wild. Two reasons. One, they need a warmer temperature. They don't like overwinter. So what you call insects that don't die in the winter and or their eggs are laid and can go through a freeze thaw cycle. That's called overwintering. Um, Acada domesticus, common house cricket can't do that. So because of that, they're a non-invasive species through all 50 states of the U.S. So that's why they legally can be shipped live across state lines. It's only those and the banded cricket that it is the case for that. But the reason that we raise those as well, instead of um, most people in Iowa think of the big black cricket that they see in their basement or their garage that like really, really crunches when they step on it. Everybody oh. tells me that story. <laughs> yes, everybody tells me that story. Um, but that crunch sound is exactly why you wouldn't necessarily want to eat it. It wouldn't be as pleasant of a mouthfeel because that exoskeleton is so hard. So the little brown crickets are a lot softer. They're a lot nicer to eat. But um, you had a question. What was the question? Oh, lifespan. Lifespan, lifespan in, in the wild. Yes. Yeah. So, yep. Yeah, so in captivity versus in the wild. So why it only takes 45 days in captivity is because we keep the temperature steady. Um, out in the wild, nighttime temperature versus daytime temperature. Temperature is the number one factor for um, growth, maturity, the quickness of all of that. So in the wild, they'll live possibly up to five months because they, the temperature goes up and down. Um, that's obviously not the case in a controlled environment, which is why we can turn them in 45 days, which is ideal for us. Yeah. Got you. That, that's interesting to me. I, I wanted to ask you that question from the beginning, and I, we didn't cover that when we had our intro call before. That was just curious to me because you can see it when we're talking about animal sources of protein, you can picture a baby animal, and you can picture an adult animal, but I cannot picture a baby cricket and an adult cricket and differentiate between the two. And that's just not, it's not something that, that we know because like you said, it, it, it invases or invasive or non-invasive species. We, we kind of tend to think of our poor little dear friends, the crickets as pests more than anything else. So I think we haven't always put the care or thought into it. We just see that things there and it's making noise. Um, we've had at the yoga studio every year, we'll get one or two crickets 
inside the studio and I take them outside. I actually catch them in a cup and with a paper underneath and I transport them outside and put them into the bush because I don't, I don't want to hurt them, but they're loud. <laughs> well, and so I will tell you every time you have a loud cricket like that, a hundred percent of the time it's a male, oh. only the male. Yeah. The female crickets don't chirp. So well, thanks, <laughs> every ladies. annoying one. <laughs> yes, exactly. So every annoying cricket is a male cricket. It's not a female. <laughs> the ladies are not disturbing Shavasana. Only the dudes are. Sorry, dudes. Exactly. I'm still nice to him. I still put him outside, but I'm, exactly. I'm a little annoying. Well, <laughs> and um, so, no, it's it's funny that you say that because I, I have a YouTube channel where I run people through the life cycle of Ooh. the cricket as, like, as I grow them. So I even managed to capture... I think it was in March, maybe April, baby crickets hatching, like physically hatching out of the eggs. Like I got that on video, which I was floored. I was through, I was so excited. Oh. <laughs> and I just, I, it was such a like little cricket nerdy moment. But, um, you know, I'd been raising crickets for two and a half years and I'd never been able to like catch that on video. So it was pretty cool to do that. They look like little, little shrimp. Oh, um, oh my goodness. What they really look like. But you, know, you can go check that out on the YouTube channel. There's, you can you can see all sorts of developing crickets at that point. Is that Jim and Eats on um, on YouTube, or is it's that a yeah, personal account? If you just if you search Jim and Eat crickets on YouTube, um, it should take you right to it. Excellent. I didn't see that before we got on, so I will check that out afterwards, and I'll share that with our listeners and watchers because I think that would be that would be interesting. I think the more we know about something. I don't know. I think I think it gets easier to to understand the life process. I guess we, we just it's again it's not something we've ever thought about. Nor had nor had I previously thought about the nutrition profile of a cricket and how beneficial that could be. And right. also in comparison to other types of farming, because you have forty five days until essentially you have animal turnover that is able to be turned into a product instead of two years or three years or however long and the dairy industry is just something to be uh, considered in general. <laughs> dairy dairy is, is it's um, problematic for digestion for many, many people and then also kind of what goes on behind the scenes. But yeah, this is a really cool thing. I'm kind of, this is mind boggling to me to learn about all of this from you. So I'm really excited. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. As far as the sustainability goes, and we can get into the nitty gritty of facts and percentages and things like that, but you mentioned that they take significantly less water and land and feed. What do you feed the crickets? Yeah, good question. Um, so currently they're fed a non-GMO insect diet blend that is actually sourced seven miles south of um, south of the original farm. That was really lucky that that even existed. Um, that being said, I am now exploring the option of, of going 100% organic on their feed. Uh, and it's it's basically just a chicken feed. Is And you could feed it to chickens and they'd be very, very happy. Um, it, that's they the one thing you do need to make sure kind of like us that actually crickets are somewhat similar to us in that um there's certain studies that show if humans get enough protein and they satisfy the protein side they have less tendency to overeat on the rest of their diet crickets are very uh they need full complete amino acid profile on the protein as well otherwise they start eating each other so they'll oh, get no. carnivorous Yes. Yeah, so if you get that wrong in terms of what you're feeding them, they're kind of jerks to each other and will start eating each other. So, oh, no. um, <laughs> yeah. but, uh, so yeah, so we're going to start probably testing, um, the fully organic feed here shortly coming up this spring. And if it goes well, we'll switch over to that. I mean, the non GMO is great. And the non GMO is, is, you know, 10 minutes away versus the organic stuff is two hours away. But um, if I can make this switch over to fully organic, I would really prefer to do that. So working on it. Cool. Now, does your dad still do traditional monocrop farming too? 
Yep. So we do, uh, like I said, you just corn and soybeans. Um, we do things a little differently here and have for many years in comparison to like when you think of really conventional, you think where they're like tilling, tilling the ground multiple times, um, all that kind of stuff. We've done strip till, so it's very, very precision oriented. And we've done that for about 15 years. So in terms of like the, um, the soil health and all of that organic matter, um, all of that is way higher in our soil than the people who are neighboring us. Erosion is a lot bigger issue for them. Compaction, um, for example, like in a conventional till farm, if you get a whole bunch of rain or things like that, you, you can't do anything because the, the soil structure doesn't allow for that water to be brought in and held. It just sits on the surface and creates a big mud pit and it just doesn't work very well. The way that we treat the land and all that kind of stuff we have a lot more structure in the soil and that kind of deal. So we can move and do things when other people can't. So there's lots of advantages from an economic standpoint. And then obviously from just the soil health and all of that. So uh, in many ways, yes, I grew up on a conventional farm, but we do things a little different, even when people think we're crazy. So uh, kind of like eating crickets. I like it. I was just, the reason I asked, I'm, I'm remembering now on one of the, I think maybe even the episode before this will release is with um, Jennifer Terry of Des Moines Waterworks. And she said that she grew up, she grew up on a dairy farm in Northeast Iowa, but they also had, um, they had some crops as well. And she, it made, it made me sad to hear this. And I'm hoping your dad is not the same way, but I know you'd said before that uh, you do it kind of differently. And sometimes people think you're a little crazy. She said that when, She's talked to people before that they'd go to the co-op, like the farmer's co-op, and people wouldn't talk to them because they were like the weird, different ones that were doing something differently. And I hope your dad doesn't have that same experience. We can all think each other's a little crazy as long as we're all playing nice still. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, it's one of those things that uh, no doubt um, he gets talked about uh, just because of, you know doing things differently and all of that and and people are always going to talk but quite frankly if they're not talking about you then you're probably doing something there wrong you go. i like that <laughs> she sent me a documentary actually that i need to pass along to a few of our other farmer guests so i will remember to send that to you it's just on farming and water quality and kind of what happens down the road and she said it was a really really interesting watch i think you guys and yeah my buddy eric would probably like it too so i'll remember to send that to you but Nice. So what do, what part of uh, Northeast Iowa did she grow up in? And know? I feel so bad. I don't remember. She... Fine. My dad grew up. My dad also grew up on a dairy farm in Northeast Iowa. So really? It's like Northeast Iowa. Yeah, it's like the Northeast Iowa thing. It's definitely dairy country up there. Oh, crazy. So. Funny. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'll have to find out. She lives in Des Moines now. She's bounced, bounced back. Well, you can hear her on the previous episode, but she's bounced back and forth yeah. from um, the Iowa Environmental Council and the um, Des Moines Waterworks. So she's been nice. she's been great. She works with farmers to make sure that all of our waterways stay nice and clean and healthy while still letting them maintain what they're doing. It's a really really great coalition type of thing. So interesting. Yeah, very cool. She's good peoples. Very good peoples. So what plans do you have? For the future, you have you have a fourth line or fourth product that we haven't actually talked about on the topic of farming. You have, is it called frass? Yeah, cricket frass. Um, so that is a fancy word for poop, but uh, <laughs> we like to call it frass because it's cooler that way. Uh, so that actually has a lot of uh, potential benefits for, again, like soil health and, and using as a natural fertilizer and things like that. Um, it functions sort of as a natural pesticide is the best way that I like to describe it. So if you think about a plant when it grows, and mind you, this is the way it was explained. Well, this wasn't the way it was explained to me. Somebody much smarter than me explained this whole process to me one time, and this is how I regurgitate it. So take that for what it's worth. But um, so if you think about a plant when it grows, when you or I are threatened or an animal is threatened, what does it do? You either can run away or you can fight. Like that's the whole fight or flight response. You know, we, we have that naturally. 
you think about a plant that's being attacked, quote unquote, being eaten by something, they have no defense. They can't run. Um, they can do it through toxins. They can do it, you know, there, there's natural defenses they have, but they don't have a choice to move necessarily. So um, using cricket frass in your garden or with your flowers or things like that essentially sends a chemical signal to that plant. Hey, we're getting eaten by an insect. We need to shore up our defenses. So it ends up with stronger plant structure, things flower faster because they think, shoot, we need to reproduce really quickly if we're getting eaten by this thing. So we're going to do all essentially a chemical reaction within the plant that makes it stronger and healthier and, and more vibrant. Um, like I said, that was explained in a much more technical way to me, but that is my interpretation of it. I thought that was um, great. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really cool sort of, uh, like I said, natural natural fertilizer, natural pesticide, quote unquote, um, that, so I've heard pot growers on the West Coast really like it because of the, um, like I said, the, the faster flowering, the um, potential, you know, pest control, because it makes the plant not taste good kind of thing. Um, so yeah, all of these things are on, I, they make, they grow really good tomatoes, uh, because it's high in calcium, it helps prevent things like root rot and uh, blight and stuff like that, that people typically have that problem here in Iowa. So um, I don't know. It's one of those things. I don't, um, I don't sell that as myself anymore. We put it on our sweet corn patch. <laughs> That's about it. Um, but, but I have four growers around the state that they all retain their frass rights. Like I don't buy the frass from them, so they're allowed to market it. So my four growers, um, if anybody wants frass for their garden, they can go to them and they can purchase it directly from those growers. So all of the stuff that I produce though, like I said, goes straight to our garden and our sweet corn patch. Got so. you. Cool. Do you do yeah. the sweet corn just for yourself or do you take that? Do you do markets with the crickets? That will be the next question actually. Yeah, so I that was actually how I started selling the crickets was at the local farmers market here in Ames. And then I moved on to Des Moines the second year. And then obviously last year was very different in terms of the whole farmers market scene. Some of them went forward and some of them didn't. Um, but yeah, I like to do markets. I like to do live events. Anytime I can sample out crickets and stuff like that is great because it's part of half the battle of getting people to try them the first time. Um, but uh we don't otherwise no like the sweet corn patch that's just for for family and and friends we always end up growing way more than we need and so we end up giving away more than we have um but other than that yeah it's uh i do markets for the crickets but other than that no got you so usually you would do are you still doing the ames one or are you just doing the des moines one now so last summer uh des moines didn't have a market they had oh, like a yes. drive through market uh, eventually I think they figured out how to do that, but I was never a part of it. So I did Ames a couple weekends last year and had some really, really good weekends despite, you know, everything going on, which was cool. Uh, it was awesome to see people out, you know, supporting local producers given all of the challenges that everyone had. Um, this upcoming year, I don't know if I will do Des Moines yet. They haven't really decided if they're moving forward with a market yet, which is somewhat frustrating for us producers, but it is what it is. Um, so I, I might do a few in Ames. Um, I'm sort of building out my event calendar right now, but it's still super hard to plan anything because nobody, you know, it. we just don't know what the restrictions are going to be come May, June, July. So I'm hopeful that there's a few events that are going to move forward, but we'll see. Maybe Cedar Falls Farmer's Market. I should come up and do that one. It ran. It ran last year. They were they were very good about booth spacing and things like that. And the vendors really took it very seriously because they knew that the only way they were going to be able to sell their product at did. market was what if, if they took everything seriously. Not that anybody wouldn't have in general anyways, but... Um, several friends of mine usually do the markets and they were very thankful to be able to still do it. And there was, I think in, in Waverly, they're kind of doing a market pickup now in the off season, if there are off season products, because having a bunch of people milling around indoors, isn't really the best idea either. You can kind of order your market goods and then pick up the market goods. So it's almost 
almost functioning as kind of a, a by order co-op sort of situation now, which is, is nice that, you know, everyone was able to figure something out fast enough because that a lot of people really rely on market season for the majority of what they're doing. Yes. Well, and don't get me wrong. I mean, that was a huge, huge pivot for me um, last year. That would have been, so I actually wasn't licensed as a food processor until the end of 2019. Um, I got that food license in November of 2019. So previous to that, I was only allowed to sell at farmer's markets legally. Um, I couldn't sell online. I couldn't be on grocery store shelves, couldn't do any of that. So thankfully, though, I laid that groundwork pre-2020, because otherwise we wouldn't be sitting here having this conversation. Yeah, I can right that. before 2020. Um, it, <laughs> yes, it wouldn't have worked otherwise. And so um, I was I was really, really lucky. And I would echo the thoughts of your Cedar Falls friends who said they're just thankful to have a place where they could still have the markets. Because, so I, I did some farmer's markets. Like I said, I did Ames. I did, I did a few live events. Like there were a few here and there. Um, but even so I did 10% of my 2019 sales from live markets, like in 2020, that's a huge, huge hit, like a massive hit. Um, and so, but luckily for me, like I, I could adapt, I could be on grocery store shelves, I could push online, I could do those things. Um, but it was still a really tough year. So I can very much sympathize with those thoughts of, of having those things taken away. So here's to 2021 and hopefully having some live events, like it would be, it'd be super great, but. We'll oh see. my gosh. I, large crowds and I don't always get along. My nervous system is a little temperamental, but I, I even I am missing them at this point. Like I just wanna I just wanna appropriately walk within six feet of someone and not like get anxious about it. <laughs> yeah, we'll get there. We'll get there. But so in addition to perhaps being able to find you hopefully at a market near you at some time in 2021 and hopefully sooner than later. We can also find you at a couple Des Moines locations and a couple additional high vs Yes. So actually, I'm really glad you just brought this up because I just shipped my first order up to Northeast Iowa. Oh. Um, I'm, I will be on the shelves at um, a store called Renewed Purpose in Waverly. Oh, cool. Um, yeah. So they, I had reached out to them and they said, yeah, send us some samples. We don't, we don't know if we could make this work or not, but I was like, mm, let me tell you, I got a lot of family up there. So, I think <laughs> it happen. Um, so yeah, so that will hopefully be to them in the next couple of days. Uh, so it's renewed purpose. I assume it's on main street. No, it's on East Bremer Ave as I have the I have East the address Bremer right in Avenue front. is oh. the equivalent of Main Street. Is the main street. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Oh. I think I know which one. I, I think I am picturing the storefront actually. So yeah, you did a brief stint in Waterloo too. So you were in Waterloo. I'm in Cedar Falls. Waverly is about mm, 17 minutes down the highway. So pretty close. Yes. No, definitely. And well, so my, my boyfriend played football at Wartburg. My cousin's. Um, like my godparents, their sons, they all went to Wartburg. One of them was an all American wrestler there. Wow. The other two played basketball. Like I have, I have a lot of like Waverly connections. So um, that's why this, this lady was like, I don't know if we'll have enough people to support something like this, but like we're willing to try it. And I was like, Oh no, I know a lot of people there. Like this would be perfect. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so we'll get it figured out. But so yeah, so that is my one Northeast Iowa location, hopefully adding a few more here in the near future. But yeah, if you're in central Iowa, I have a few different high V locations, Campbell's Nutrition, uh, both their university and their Urbandale locations, uh, Wheatsfield Cooperative here in Ames. If you are in the eastern Iowa sort of area, all three locations of new pioneer co-ops, so Cedar Rapids, Iowa City, and Coralville, all carry them as well. Um, or you can always order online from JiminyCrickets.com and it can be shipped straight to your door. Ta da so. <laughs> Love it. And if we want to find out more information too, or your Instagram, you are hella funny. I took a little deep <laughs> scroll back there. That's some good content right there. I very much enjoyed that. So you are Jim underscore Jim is in G 
Y-M. We're going to clarify that. So we're thinking of Jiminy Cricket. This is a fun word yes. play on gym where you go to work out. Letter N, eat crickets. Jim underscore N underscore eat underscore crickets on Instagram. Uh, some good stuff. I had some good belly laughs there. <laughs> and then you are on Facebook. And then news to me, happy day, you have a wonderful YouTube channel where we can find um, the growth cycle. If I'm, I'm now curious, I'm very much going to hang up and then go look because I want to see the little baby crickets, cricket shrimp. Um, and then other than that, hopefully we'll get to see you at some more stores, some more co-op areas. And uh, you're just going to explode in the cricket industry in Iowa. And Listen, beyond. we're trying. And beyond. And beyond. <laughs> and beyond. We're trying. Let's, let's do Iowa first, and then we'll go to the Midwest, and then we'll, we'll move on from there. But, there you go. Yeah. Well, cool. So now what is your, let's see, we didn't cover it in the beginning. We'll leave off on this note. You have a couple different flavors of the dry roasted crickets. Which flavor is your favorite? My, so I've, I've, oh, this is hard. This is like choosing a favorite child. Oh, if no. I, you know, <laughs> if have children. Um, no, so I tend to gravitate towards either a hot and spicy or a dill pickle or like a fiesta. Fiesta tastes kind of like Doritos. Um, nobody ever believes me until they try it. And then they're like, oh my gosh, it tastes like Doritos. But there's no, um, there's no dairy in it. It's nutritional yeast that gives it. The cheesiness um so those three are probably my top but my top seller is smoky barbecue like far and above everybody loves smoky barbecue which is fine it's a flavor i'm good with that um but then of the energy bars my favorite far and above is lemon but i find that lemon is a very polarizing flavor either you love lemon or you hate it and i'm one of those lemon lovers so i really like that one second is probably banana bread for me on that one but salted caramel is my best seller of those salted caramel and chocolate mocha so yeah so you are you are leaning more towards the pungent and the spicy though your market usually leans a little bit more sweet i guess barbecue is sweet too sweet yeah and then yeah it's probably nice to have something like that's a familiar flavor that nacho cheese kind of fiesta is a very familiar flavor to most people too Right. Yeah. Well, and that is, that is why I don't have all of these crazy, like matcha turmeric, um, you know, maca, like that's why I don't go into those kind of flavors because what I'm already trying to get people to do is so weird that it, I do need to give them more of a familiar vehicle, I suppose sure. that then so maybe one day down the road, I'll get a more sophisticated sort of flavor lineup and, and have like a, a spicy chocolate or something, you know, all of those things that you don't necessarily think about, but I'm sure you saw it coming through like the health food store. You had the very generic flavors that were like very traditional, but then you did, you had like the superfood matcha, aronia berry, you know what I mean? Like it's the, the really wild kind of stuff. I can't mash both of those right now because right now we're, we're trying to get people to eat insects. So one day. This is an Iowa joke. We'll leave off with an Iowa joke. Do you have ranch flavored crickets? I have a buffalo ranch you have flavored a crickets. That is even more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yes. Guys, I, I'm not necessarily one of them. I like it on special occasions with specific things. Again, dairy, I try to get, but I'd like... Man, Iowans really love their ranch dressing. <laughs> and I will tell you, this is a dairy-free ranch. So oh, this is yay. a... Yay! Yep. Yeah. Happy day. Happy day. Yep. So that is the other note, I suppose, with my products. They are, with the exception of the crickets themselves, they're free of seven of the eight major allergens. And like I said, the only thing being the crickets, their relationship with shellfish makes them a potential shellfish allergy problem. I'm glad you told me that. I happen to be allergic to shellfish. Yeah, so I'm intrigued. All of them, or some of them? Uh, well, at least shrimp, so far that we know. Okay, well, and so the reason I ask that is because shellfish allergies are really, really weird. In that, like, there will be people that are allergic to saltwater shellfish, but like not freshwater shellfish. So they can't eat shrimp or lobster, but they can eat crawfish, or they can eat. Um, 
I don't know what other freshwater shellfish there are, but so it, they're weird. Uh, the only reason that crickets are related is the chitin in their exoskeleton. Okay. Um, are you allergic to mushrooms? Nope. Love mushies. Okay. So there's chitin in, in mushrooms as well. Chitin is the second most abundant biopolymer in the world after cellulose. Hmm. So yeah, yeah, think about like mushrooms and fungi and all of that stuff. That's in everything too. So chitin is in everything. Yeah. So well, happy. So oh, since I can that. eat mushrooms and I can probably eat crickets, maybe hopefully we're, we're going to try it in the parking lot of the hospital with an EpiPen. I'm not that allergic, <laughs> but I am allergic. <laughs> I was going to say, if you're anaphylactic, I would not recommend it. But if you're not, like it's worth just trying it and seeing what happens. <laughs> I'll give it a shot and see what happens. Knowing yeah, full there well. you go. Interesting. Oh, I love it. Well, thank you, Shelby. This has been so great. I think I love every guest that comes on here and every conversation that I get to have, but this is definitely kind of holding its own as far as uh, innovation, I guess, in the product that you're working with and being able to learn so much about something that I don't know anything about and I think a lot of other people don't too. So thank you for educating us and thank you for taking a leap and thanks to your family for supporting that big leap and ordering all of your crickets alongside you and uh, I'm excited to see what happens and I'm excited to try them yeah awesome well thanks so much for having me you are so so very welcome all right guys I will see you next time on the ethical consumer podcast go check out Shelby and her gym and eats crickets on their social media <laughs>